least uh, on behalf of our Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi, let me welcome the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of Canada, to India, uh, and uh, uh, to this conversation, which is, I think, uh, a very interesting conversation around a theme that we are all very interested in. Uh, we are grateful that you could manage to wriggle out some time from a busy schedule to come and have this conversation with all of us. Uh, we are, I would also like to thank uh, a very distinguished audience today here who are very keen to hear you and hopefully um, on, on some of the larger issues of global governance, uh, women in peace and security, and also in India-Canada relations. Uh, we would like to keep it very interactive, um, and uh, the minister herself was insistent that she would make very brief remarks so that there is more of an interaction. Uh, and so please, um, we hope that uh, to have a very uh, significant uh, amount uh, interesting set of questions and answers later on, so keep your pens and papers ready. Uh, and with this, uh, let me formally introduce the minister. And, uh, and I was in its very impressive CV that she has. You name an institution that is at the top of the world, and she, that's in her resume from Harvard, Oxford, Reuters, Financial Times, Washington Post, um, economists, so it's very difficult to, uh, to figure out where to begin and where to end. But it's, uh, I think it's one of those things that when you see a CV like that, you always get a bit startled that, you know, um, uh, what are we going to talk about? But I think I'm glad that we are, we are going to talk about um, an issue that pertains to some of the things that we are also doing at ORF. We are very interested in this, in this wider theme in which Canada has taken a leadership role. Uh, women, peace and security, the agenda that, that is being framed around this theme and that, that agenda that we have taken forward in our research at ORF as well. Uh, it was part of a panel uh, at the Raisina Dialogue that we host every year, the, the foremost geopolitical conference that India hosts uh, every January. And uh, so uh, about the minister herself, she uh, has been a member of parliament uh, since 2013 and in a remarkably short period of time she has had two very heavy duty portfolios, international trade, and now foreign affairs. Uh, and as, uh, as those of you who are following um, uh, uh, you know, India-Canada relations over the last few, year, few days, in fact, can, can see how challenging it can be at times. Um, it's not an easy job. Uh, and so therefore, I'm uh, extremely delighted to again welcome you, Madam Minister, uh, Christia, as, as, as she insisted that I call her. Uh, and with that, uh, a very, very brief uh, intro in the context in which we are having this discussion. Of course, you are all well aware uh, that uh, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister is visiting India, and uh, Christy is part of the dele delegation, of course. But I think India-Canada relations itself, we have seen a blossoming uh, of, of ties. They, they seem to be uh, poised to take off. Uh, Mr. Modi, uh, Indian Prime Minister, visited Canada in 2015, uh, and with the then Prime Minister of Canada laid out a very expansive roadmap of Indo-Canadian relations. Uh, there are, of course, if you are following the media these days, you know that there are some uh, problems, there are some wrinkles here and there. Uh, but I think uh, with good, good diplomats like yourself, uh, we are sure we are going to uh, smooth uh, and, and go over them. Uh, and uh, I think the larger context in which we are looking at the world perhaps is a very important uh, aspect of the relationship. Two major democracies looking at the rules-based global order, how can we work together in that context is perhaps uh, an element of the theme that we are going to discuss today, which is uh, how do we view conflict and security and how we uh, change our approach to conflict and security in a world where perhaps power relations, gender relations have tended to shape, those uh, shape uh, global politics and global security in a certain way. With that, uh, may I allow, invite you to give a brief uh, primer, if I may, on Canada's role in how uh, Canada has taken a leadership position, why it has taken a leadership position. I'm sure some of us are familiar with that, but some in the audience may not know exactly why Canada feels it's so important to have a, a, a gendered approach to conflict and security, and what are the implications for the global order itself. Okay, thank you very much, Harsh. And, um, uh, you know, Harsh has already said uh, that I promised to make brief opening remarks. Of course, when a politician says remarks will be brief, everything is in the eye of the beholder. But I will try to keep that promise. Uh, and I did want to start by thanking everyone who is here. And I would like to say a special welcome to any Canadians who are here and also to anyone who has studied in Canada. Um, in the ladies' room just a minute ago, I met someone who told me she had just come home to India from the University of Toronto, 
which is in my constituency. And Canada is very proud that uh, India is now the second largest group of international students in Canada are from India. And the number of students from India has almost doubled over the past two years. So we're very, very proud to be educating all of these brilliant Indian scholars. And please keep on coming. Um, my constituency is called University Rosedale, so I have a special interest in getting lots of brilliant Indian students to come to our country. Um, Harsh, you started off by talking about the shared interests of Canada and India as two democracies. Uh, and before diving into the women, peace, and security agenda, I just wanted to talk about that for one minute. And I really wanted to say to all of the Indians who are here, what an important role India is playing in the world today, and what an important partner, therefore, Canada sees in India, not only in our bilateral relationship, but in terms of the role that India is playing in the world. Uh, India, as everyone knows, is the world's largest democracy. Um, this year, uh, it is on track to be the world's fastest growing economy as well. And those two factors are so important because as I think two democracies like our own, Canada and India, are very aware, now is a moment, you know, perhaps uniquely since the Second World War, when the whole idea of democracy as an effective form of government is maybe being questioned more in the world today than it has been for a long time. And in particular, I think a lot of people around the world are starting to ask, are democracies able to deliver strong economic growth? And so, thank you, India, uh, because for all of those people who have doubts about democracy, looking at India, look at your incredibly strong economic performance in the world, economic performance, it, that is the answer. And for Canada, one of our top objectives in the world is to continue to strengthen, develop this rules-based international order to strengthen those democratic values. I, I can think of nothing more important, really, than a strong, successful, democratic India in pursuing that big international objective. And so that, at a really high level, for me, is one of the key reasons that it's so important for all of us to be working with India and why I'm so happy to be here. Um, on the women, peace, and security agenda. So as you may know, uh, our prime minister is proud to describe himself as a feminist. And actually, on the day that our government was sworn in, the way things work in Canada, you know, like you, we're a Westminster-style democracy, um, but we don't know. The ministers, like, you know that you're going to be a minister, but you don't know who all the other ministers are. And in fact, when you go in to be vetted by the prime minister, he and his team say, and if you tell anybody that you're going to be in the cabinet, maybe you won't be in the cabinet anymore. I remember asking, could I tell my husband? And the prime minister was like, yeah, you can tell your husband. So it's a very, very closely held secret. And... We all kind of got on the bus to go to the Governor General's residence, and we realized that the Prime Minister had actually fulfilled a campaign promise, which was to have a 50-50 gender-balanced cabinet, half women, half men. And, you know, I'm a politician, and I fulfill every single promise I make on the campaign trail, of course, but, you know, it doesn't always 100% happen. And it was really an astonishing thing, and... I have to say, I have been really positively impressed by the impact that decision, probably the first big decision Prime Minister Trudeau made upon becoming Prime Minister has had, both inside Canada and around the world. Just that demonstration effect. Um, I was with the Prime Minister at a supper, I won't say who this was with, but at a supper with another world leader. and. Um, this world leader was sort of saying, well, you know, um, I think it's a good idea to have more women in government, but isn't it hard to get enough good ones? 
and don't the other men in your party, don't they start feeling bad that it's a 50-50 cabinet and they don't have as many chances to be in cabinet as they would otherwise? And, you know, don't you have difficulty making, you know, striking that balance between a gender-balanced cabinet and merit-based appointments? And the prime minister said, and I will never forget this, he said, you know, the men in my caucus are lucky I have a 50-50 gender balanced cabinet, because if it were purely on merit, there might not be any men in the cabinet. And I can tell you, this world leader who was a man, I'll tell you that much, he lo I remember him looking at the prime minister and I just kind of thought, this guy is thinking, wow, those Canadians really are out there. Um, when it comes to the women, peace, and security agenda, uh, we have said, and are acting on a feminist foreign policy, not only because it's in keeping with our values, but it is in keeping with our values, but because we know that actually it is what works. I know that India now, in a lot of your approach to issues like education, um, have really bought into the idea that empowering and educating women and girls is the best way to fight poverty. It is the best way to ensure economic growth, especially for the most underprivileged. And that economic impact of empowering and educating women and girls is 100% a fact and a reality. But it's also the case when it comes to peace and security, which is a space where, until quite recently, we really haven't thought of a feminist agenda as being relevant. But the reality is, when you look at security issues, where you engage women and girls, you find that you have much more durable peace solutions and peacekeeping, which is much more effective. And actually, I'm just I'm going to wrap up now, but I just want to wrap up by saying, and India has played a, a really leading role in this. Uh, I had a very good meeting, including a delicious lunch. I love Indian food. You guys are so lucky. Um, with your foreign minister, Sushma. And I talked to her about India's really pioneering efforts in UN peacekeeping in Liberia, where India had the all-woman police unit. And that was something which was credited by the UN, um, by the wonderful feminist and woman leader of Liberia as having a very positive demonstration effect on the engagement of women in peace and security in Liberia itself. Liberian women were inspired by the example of Indian women and also in making that peacekeeping effort more effective. And I just want to close on the peace and security agenda with a final point where again India has been playing a really leading role and we're looking forward to working in collaboration with India. And, you know, this is how ensuring the effectiveness and credibility of UN peacekeepers going forward. Now, India has an incredibly proud track record when it comes to UN peacekeeping. No country has been as enthusiastic a peacekeeper as India has been. And I think that is very true to India's values. And so I think India, as much as any other country in the world, is concerned by what I think is one of the most horrible things that has happened in recent times, which is sexual abuse and exploitation by UN peacekeepers. This is a really horrific thing. Um, you know, it goes against the whole idea of peacekeeping. And at a time when there are some people who are challenging the validity of the UN, I think there's a real risk that it discredits the UN in a profound way. Now, you tell me, but I don't think there is any better way to ensure that UN peacekeepers do not abuse and exploit women and children than to have a lot of them actually be women themselves. Um, so this is really an effort that we believe in, that we know will make peacekeeping more effective. And we are so pleased to be working with India on it because India has shown such leadership in the area. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I just follow it up with a, with a question? Uh, in the sense that uh, you have taken a very uh, key role, uh, along with, I think, countries like Sweden, 
uh, in, in framing the agenda around women, peace, and security. And I was wondering if you can talk to uh, some of the challenges that you encounter, because a large part of the world has a different point of view. And when you're working in a multilateral organization like the UN, where the idea is that all countries are sovereign, so everyone makes decisions based on their national interest, how do you move your foreign policy, how do you maneuver your foreign policy around some of the challenges that you face in your bilateral relations with individual countries? Um, so, you know, Harsh, the interesting thing is, um, at least when it comes to peacekeeping specifically, there is a broad consensus at a theoretical level that increasing the number of women peacekeepers is the right thing to do. In fact, there's a UN Security Council resolution that has been passed in joining us all to do this. Um, so the theory, the rhetoric is there. Um, what is harder to do is to actually do it in practice. Um, but I think it's an important first step. You know, the fact, the fact that at the UN level, we have agreed this is the right thing to do. Now, in terms of practice, from the time of that UN decision, we've gone from 4.2 to 4.4% women peacekeepers. So that's not stunning progress. Um, and what is left now is not so much to debate the merits of the case as to actually get it done. And, and again there, I, I really think, you know, the Indian example in Liberia is a really good example. And I don't know how many Indians in the audience are familiar with it, but it was both incredibly effective on the ground and the Indian women who participated um, reported themselves to be very, very happy with that experience. Um, so, you know, I think we do have the international commitment and it's now a question of thinking about what are the practical steps. And so, you know, in taking the peacekeeping specifically, what we're trying to do, we, we announced that this would be a major initiative of ours at uh, a UN peacekeeping summit held in Vancouver in the fall. India was present there with a high level delegation, so thank you, India. And what we've been trying to do since then is kind of break down and figure out what are the practical steps that need to be taken. And sometimes these are just really small specific things. So I was talking with a Canadian woman who had been working in the UN system on peacekeeping and she said in one country where there was a big UN peacekeeping mission, for all the women there, there was only one bathroom and it was 500 meters away from their barracks. And in another place, the bathrooms had no doors. So these are not high level philosophical issues. These are really practical issues that need to be resolved to make it possible for women to want to go, for us to want our sisters and our daughters to go and serve in missions like this. Um, yes, I think um, this is uh, the great point that you made about, um, about toilets, because I, uh, the Indian government has, has I can't invested. believe we're talking about well, that, yes, actually. Yes, no, but I think that's a, that's a really important issue for, from, in the Indian context as well, because we are looking at, uh, this, the government has invested a lot in terms of providing sanitation, proper sanitation, to, uh, especially to girls. And, uh, and this is an area where India has not traditionally not done very well, and we are looking at uh, taking the, this discussion forward with some real policy impact on the ground. And I was wondering if, if there are discussions that you are having with your Indian counterparts. I mean, as you pointed out, uh, we have two very formidable uh, women ministers, both Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in India and Minister of Defense, both are women. Uh, I was wondering if, if, uh, if this feminist aspect of, of the bilateral agenda is, is uh, something that you are also carrying forward with India in some respect. Are there conversations around, you, you talk about UN peacekeeping, but is there else, what, what else is happening on that front? Um, yeah, absolutely. I was going to make a joke and say, well, you guys don't know what women talk about when it's just the two of us in the room, right? Um, you can only imagine. Um, but uh, no, of course, I had uh, a really good meeting uh, today with Sushma, uh, your very impressive foreign minister. Um, one of the things I asked her about was how she manages social media because she has a truly astonishing social media following. And I, as a former journalist, used to think I was good at that, but um, there are a lot of things to be learned from her on that communications front. But one of the things we talked about uh, a lot 
uh, was women, peace, and security, and particularly the Indian experience and what there is to learn from that. Um, so for sure, definitely an element, and I do um, want to mention also your defense minister, Nirmala, who I know from the time when we were both trade ministers, and she came and uh, met with me in Toronto. So um, you are doing very well on women in senior posts in your government. Yes, I think these are baby steps we have taken, but I think they're very important ones because, as you point out, uh, to have women in those positions is very important um, for 50% of our population to at, at least aspire to. So, uh, you know, you have written a very interesting book on economic inequality, uh, very well regarded, uh, bestseller, uh, but I think it makes some very pertinent points to the, to the kind of conversations we are having today about globalization, where globalization is going. Uh, I was, and I was wondering if you can talk about uh, talk a bit about uh, that aspect of governance because that is also impacting the sort of issues we are looking at uh, uh, in terms of women, peace, and security. How do you how do how how does development development as an issue impact women and therefore structure the realities in which um, gender realities are constructed, masculinities are preferred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, that's a lot of questions um, in a few sentences, but let me try to take them in turns. Um, and let me talk a little bit about rising income inequality and particularly sort of um, a group that I talked about in my book as the global 1% or the global 0.1%. And I should also say thank you so much, Harsh, for mentioning my book. As anyone who has written a book knows, um, you sort of want to hug and kiss anyone who actually knows it exists. Um, so thank highly you. recommend it. Please buy it. <laughs> there you go. No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, sh I wasn't asking for more. I was just saying thank you. Um, but you know, the thesis of my book um, was that this increase globally and in so and in many Western countries, including Canada, of income inequality and the rise of people at the very, very top who were becoming this sort of global elite at the same time that you saw the middle class squeezed was a structural phenomenon that a combination of the technology revolution and globalization were creating. Um, that in some ways the economic forces of our time were driving this sort of new social distribution. And what I argued was that this new social distribution was in the medium term going to be very difficult for our democracies to tolerate. Uh, and a world in which you had a small group of people doing astonishingly, unbelievably well, while the people in the middle and at the bottom were being squeezed, was going to be a world where people would start saying, you know, hey, is this you know, market democracy system really working for me? Um, and that concern of mine is really connected with the comment I made about India at the beginning. You know, I think we all need examples right now of market democracies that are delivering economic growth. And not only the headline figure of economic growth, but economic growth which is felt by people in the middle and the bottom of our societies to be improving their lives. It's not just about what is the GDP number, it's about are people in the middle and at the bottom actually feeling it happen to them and feeling their lives get better. And that is certainly a focus of our government and I think it's a, it's a focus in India as well. And in fact, um, to give you a sense of how important this is, I met our future prime minister at the Toronto book launch of my book. And it was a discussion of the ideas in that book um, that sort of caused him ultimately to get me to quit my job and run for parliament. And, you know, thank goodness it worked. Um, on where feminism comes in, um, in any society, a disproportionate number of the people who are poor and underprivileged are women and children. And so if you can do something to educate women, you are going to be 
inevitably helping people who are in the most difficult circumstances and helping the children who are in those most difficult circumstances. And you know, very many studies have found that the more economic support you can target to mothers, the more of that support is going to go directly to the children rather than somewhere else. Now, I don't want to cast aspersions on the excellence of fathers. Um, my own father is a great guy, and my husband is a wonderful father to our three children. But, you know, this is what study after study has shown. So if you really want to get at poverty, and frankly, if you really want to drive economic growth, then really no dollar is better spent than the dollar which is spent on educating and empowering women and girls. And that's something that we believe in and are acting on at home in Canada. And it has also become sort of the driving force of our development policy. And I, I just want to add one more thing, um, which is in no way should that be seen to be a policy that leaves out men or boys. Um, when mothers are empowered and educated, the whole family and the whole community benefits. Daughters as well as sons benefit, and the men in the community benefit too. So this is really about looking for where you can have the most impact and where you can have the most leverage. Uh, yeah, so, so two important points here. One, uh, that ideas matter, and that those who write books also can aspire for bigger things in life. You know? Well, your <laughs> High Commissioner to Canada is a renowned author as well, yes, Slumdog so Millionaire. So More power to the authors. Uh, and uh, so finally, before I open this up for discussion, uh, for, for Q&A, I think um, there is now, uh, in top positions in, 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 in global diplomacy, very strong women in, 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 in major powers, in, in major world capitals. And when you talk of uh, feminization of global discourse on, on foreign policy, on security policy, do you practically, as, as, a, as an operational person, do you see a change? Uh, do, you, do you witness that uh, in your day-to-day -day conversations, in your day-to-day, -day, you know, the work that you do as a diplomat, given that th there is, the, the proportion of women is increasing, it's not there yet, but, but it's, it's getting better. And especially at the top level, we are finding more women. I mean, there is a counter argument that uh, having women does not really matter because ultimately the structures th that underline the reality have shaped women to behave more like men. So I would, I would uh, just uh, would like to uh, get your sense as someone who is dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you? How do? You okay. Well, I have so many comments on that. The first one is just harsh to your last point, your kind of throwaway point about structures shaping women to behave more like men. I think it was Simone de Beauvoir who had, you know, one of my favorite comments from a feminist writer of all times, which is she says, whenever women act like humans, they're accused of acting like men. Um, and I think all the women in the audience will be able to sympathize with that at some level, right? Um, so let's be a little bit careful about that. Um, I also, by the way, think we need to be careful about assumptions that you know, somehow women in leadership positions are innately biologically superior to men. Um, I know lots of brilliant women, and I know lots of mediocre women, and I know lots of brilliant men, and I know lots of mediocre men, and I know lots of women who are great, wonderful, moral leaders, and I know lots of women who aren't that great. And same is true for men. And I certainly wouldn't claim on behalf of my gender some um, you know, unique possession of human virtues. We're human. Um, but it is true that women, you know, have different experiences by virtue of our gender, and those experiences can shape how we interact and how we lead. And to give you an example of that, I'll tell you one story from our cabinet in Canada. So we have the first gender balanced cabinet in Canadian history. And our government is new. We only formed government in 2015. But some ministers uh, have been ministers in previous liberal governments. And at a cabinet meeting, quite shortly after we formed government, we were having a conversation. And I think it was the prime minister who sort of out of curiosity 
uh, because it was, you know, for our prime minister, his first time in cabinet was as prime minister. Um, so he was sort of curious about what his cabinet was like compared to previous cabinets. And he asked one of the ministers who had been a minister in a previous government, he said, so, you know, um, how does this cabinet compare to the previous cabinets you've served in? And this colleague of mine, and I was sitting next to him at the table, we were all sitting at different tables, and I was sitting next to him at the table as he said, he said, you know, Prime Minister, it's really interesting, but I would say the single biggest difference is more collegiality and more working together. In this cabinet, everybody seems to start with the idea that we all have a shared project and we want to work together to get there. And in the previous cabinets I've been in, it was all about fighting and rivalry and each one of us trying to show we were the smartest and trying to cut down the other guy and so on. And um, then this colleague of mine who was a man uh, said, and you know, I just don't understand why the atmosphere and the culture is so different. And I was sitting next to him and I said, you know, could be half of us are women around the table. So that's just one very specific, um, you know, anecdote is not evidence. I'm sure there are lots of social scientists here who feel that very strongly, and I agree with you. But that is just one specific anecdote from Canadian political life of a difference uh, that having more women at the table has made. Thank you. I think I would, uh, you know, I would open it up. But before I open it up, can you briefly speak about uh, India-Canada relations and where they stand today? Because I think there, lot, there will be a lot of interest in the audience in, in hearing from you directly uh, about a few salient aspects of the relationship and, and where do you see them going? For sure. Um, so I, I, I started off a little bit on that point. And, you know, my starting point in talking about the relationship between India and Canada is to talk about the shared work we can do on multilateral issues. Uh, I think we would all agree that the world today is more in flux, that that international order and those international institutions, um, which had been around for more than 70 years, are being called into question in ways that they haven't been for a long time. And I think in this moment of flux, uh, there are a lot of values and objectives that Canada and India have in common that we need to be making common cause and working on together. And I'll give you a few examples. So we were very pleased that India sent a high-level delegation to our UN peacekeeping summit that we held in Vancouver last, no last November. Uh, India, as I say, has an incredibly proud and effective history in UN peacekeeping. It's something that Canada is committed to, too. As we all know, there are lots of voices in the world that are challenging the effectiveness of the UN. I think now is a moment for all of us who believe in the UN, who believe in peacekeeping, to say, okay, how do we reform and improve and bring into the 21st century this great institution. And that's a place where India and Canada can work together. I was actually, I met just before this meeting with your commerce minister, um, who is convening a mini ministerial to talk about ways forward for the WTO. Uh, and that is a project that Canada also very strongly supports, the idea of how we move the WTO, the rules-based international trading system, into the 21st century, I think is another very shared Canadian-Indian you know, agenda and something for us to work on. Um, we had, in January, I co-chaired with Secretary Rex Tillerson a meeting on peace and security in the Korean Peninsula, also in Vancouver. And your high commissioner in the Indian delegation was there as well. So there are a lot of troubled places in the world. The Korean Peninsula, Myanmar, to take just a few examples, where there is real scope and opportunity for Canada and India to work together. Um, I think you mentioned that I had been trade minister before. Um, and I loved being trade minister. The great thing about being trade minister is you focus on very specific, practical things. You never have to ask yourself, you know, what did I do today? 
Uh, and I think the economic relationship between Canada and India is on a good footing today, but I think that there is a lot more that we can do. There is significant investment going in both directions, and I think we can do a lot more, and significant trade in both directions, but I think we can do a lot more, particularly given that now is a moment when, while some countries are less enthusiastic about immigrants and students from abroad, Canada is very enthusiastic. I've talked about the increase in Indian students, which we really welcome. Uh, we have a global skills strategy uh, for highly skilled individuals, managers, to be able to come and work in Canada. We promise you a decision in two weeks. So I think that this is a very fruitful moment uh, for our countries to do even more together. And I really believe uh, that this uh, visit can be a real step forward in that relationship. Thank you very much. And with that, I open the session for your questions, comments. Yes, in the spirit of this being a session on women, peace, and security, let's start with a lady here. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I think for all of for those, of those who will be asking questions, please introduce yourselves. Uh, keep questions short and to the point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, in the same spirit, uh, you touched upon... And women. could I ask you, ma'am, to tell me who you are? I'm sure yes. Harsh knows everybody who's no, here, no, but it would said, help please, me please to know. Yes, you don't know me, Harsh? Okay. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm uh, Veena Ravi Kumar. I teach at Lady Shiram College over here. In, uh, it's, it's a part of Delhi University. Okay. What's your subject? International relations, political okay. science, international relations, and I've worked a lot on uh, women. In fact, interviewed 22 diplomats who were here at one point uh, on women and uh, in foreign policy decision making. So, uh, like you said, a lot of them have uh, remarked on, you know, uh, they know less than men, of course, and then a lot of them have said, because of the support of the family, we can do this. But my question to you was, in women in security, apart from the UN, which is a larger one, have you dealt with uh, any other cases in uh, security and peacekeeping? Not peacekeeping, sorry. Security issues uh, for women uh, within, say, Canada and some other nation in which you have participated and you know, done the dialoguing or some kind of a thing which has been a major rift and uh, you, you've been a part of that. Yeah, um, I'll give you one example, and I also want to comment on um, the family point that you made. Um, but let me address the main question first. Um, one project that Canada has been involved in uh, that has been really a big success story is the reform of the police force in Ukraine after the Maidan revolution. Um, as you will know, one of the big issues, I would say sort of the driving issue behind the Maidan revolution in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, was they called it in Ukraine the revolution of human dignity. And the worst thing a lot of people felt was this sort of overwhelming corruption of the government was humiliating for individual Ukrainians at the day-to-day -day level. And one source of humiliation was a police force which rather than being concerned about maintaining public order on the streets and you know, not having people speeding on the roads, was mostly concerned about extracting bribes from unfortunate drivers. Uh, and this was very dispiriting and made people really angry. So after the Maidan revolution, one of the priorities of the new government was to reform the police. And they decided that a big part of the reform would be to recruit a new group of police, of police officers and to have 25% of them be women. And the thinking was, if it was a woman police officer who stopped you after the reforms, it would be an immediate signal to people that it was a new person. It wasn't someone who was a holdover from the old corrupt era. Because it turned out, you know, the Ukrainian mafia kind of groups, they were sexist also, and they didn't really have women involved. So if a woman police officer stopped you, you knew she wasn't corrupt. It gave citizens very great confidence 
And having that 25% level had a very strong impact on the culture of the whole new police force. And I would say that reform of the police has been one of the most successful reforms in Ukraine. Canada was very proud to play a supporting role. We had RCMP officers and police officers from Canada in Ukraine helping with the training, helping with the reforms. And we happened to have a brilliant policewoman from Montreal who was of Ukrainian-Canadian descent, so she spoke Ukrainian. And she was one of the top advisors and architects of this transformation. And I was actually, I was in Ukraine on December 22nd and met with the, some of the leaders of the new police force. And they talked about how effective the reform had been. Obviously, the anti-corruption reform of the police wasn't only about having 25% women. And the interesting point part is, the Ukrainians didn't decide to do it this way because they had a feminist agenda. They decided to do it this way because they had an anti-corruption agenda. And they found that having 25% women was an effective way of doing that. Um, but I do want to say one quick thing about your point about women and the support of their families. And this is something that I like to say when I'm in Canada too. Um, I see a number of young women in the room here. And one thing that I feel very strongly about is a very important message to send to young women is that you shouldn't feel you need to choose between having a family and having a leadership role in your public life. Um, I have three children myself. Um, like those diplomats you've interviewed, it takes my family to allow me to do my job and have my three kids, in particular two of my aunts, uh, take care of my children when I'm traveling. But I really feel one very bad message that we sometimes send to young women is that you have to choose. And I personally, nothing is more important to me in my life than being a mother. Um, I love Canadians. I serve my constituents with great passion and pleasure. But at the end of the day, my kids are the single most important thing. And I think it's really important for young women to feel that they can be human beings and women and mothers, uh, as well as having a public life, if that's the choice that they make. So to the young women here, go for it, girls. Go for it, ladies. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Karthik, IIT Delhi. Uh, my question is, my audible? My question is, uh, why suddenly Ottawa is showing so much interest in India? Like, why suddenly? Why suddenly who is? Why is uh, Canada suddenly showing so much interest in India? We have the Prime Minister visiting. Why, why suddenly? Uh, well, this may seem a moment of maximum interest because the Prime Minister is here. And wherever the Prime Minister is, you know, I like to think that it's important when the foreign minister travels, but I've noticed an odd thing, which is when the prime minister travels, it makes more of an impact. Um, you tell me why. Um, I, I wouldn't call this sudden at all. Uh, you know, I myself uh, welcomed a visit from uh, the Indian Commerce Minister to Toronto when I was still trade minister myself. Um, Harsh referred to Prime Minister Modi's visit to Canada even before we formed government. Uh, I think Canada has a, a long, historic, and sustained interest in a strong relationship with India. And, you know, we are hopeful that this visit will bring that relationship to a new level and a level of closer engagement. And, you know, I would say, you know, as I said right at the beginning, um, the fact, India is occupying a particular and very important role in the world, not only as the largest democracy, which India has been for some time, but as the fastest growing economy at the same moment. Um, that's significant, and I think it means the whole world is going to be paying a lot of attention to India. And it does mean, you know, India's economic success, I think, has created more opportunities for us to do some direct work together, whether it is more Indian students 
um, being able to come and study in Canada or more Canadian firms investing in India or more Indian firms investing in Canada? Um, Ms. Freedom, my name is Sohasini Heather. I'm a journalist with the Hindu newspaper. I wanted to ask you about a security issue that does uh, uh, cause, if possible, the largest rift between India and Canada today, and that is the issue of Khalistani separatism. Uh, in the past year, we have seen uh, matters come to an head, uh, to begin with, with the Ontario legislature passing a resolution that accused India of genocide. Um, after that, Prime Minister Trudeau took part in a rally that uh, glorified separatist militants and terrorists from India, um, but also uh, saw many uh, slogans and banners for what is called Referendum 2020, for a separate Sikh uh, homeland to be, uh, to be apparently voted for. Uh, my question is, in your conversation with Ms. Swaraj this morning, did this issue come up, and how did it come up, uh, and also yesterday made the statement that his government would not support separatism uh, against India. What is the specific assurances that you would give on that? Um, well, thank you for the question. And as a former journalist, uh, it's always especially nice to have journalists in the room. Um, and let me say a couple of things about that. You know, let me start by saying, as I think the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, you know, both at home and on this trip, the, the foreign policy of the government of Canada is to support a strong and united India. Uh, we are very clear about that. Uh, and as I think people in India know, we ourselves are familiar with separatist challenges at home, uh, both historically, and there are people in Canada who advocate for uh, separatism inside our own country. So we are familiar with the challenge and our own party is a federalist party that also believes in a united federal Canada. We are also very clear in our condemnation of terrorism of all forms. And what we know in Canada is that terrorism can come from many different communities. Um, our most recent experience in Canada has been of, of, of violent, fatal terrorism, uh, has been from a white supremacist Christian roots. So I'm Christian myself. Um, and so, you know, what, what we know in our own diverse pluralist society is terrorism wherever it comes from, and we know it can come from many different places, is a threat to us all. And that is something that all of us, I would say particularly all democracies, need to be united in condemning, and that Canada is very clear in it, uh, uh, in, and Canada is very clear in its condemnation of that. Uh, we did, I did uh, discuss the issue uh, with the foreign minister, and I will leave it to her to comment on, um, you know, her impressions of the conversation. Um, but I felt that it was a very constructive and useful discussion that we had. And then just finally, I'd like to say one more thing about Canada. Um, India rightly prouds itself on being a successful, pluralist, diverse democracy. In Canada, we pride ourselves on that as well. Um, we are a diverse society. Uh, we are proud to say that our diversity is our strength. Uh, really, really proud of that. We think that that, especially in the world today, is one of the things that makes Canada very distinctive. Um, that we welcome people from around the world to our country and we welcome Canadians from all backgrounds. And we understand that terrorism can come from all communities and must be condemned by all. And we also welcome the contribution of Canadians from all communities to our own diverse society. 
very much including the community of Canadians who trace their roots back to India. It's about 1.4 million Canadians who have that kind of a connection. Um, that includes, as you guys know, um, India is a broad and diverse society, so it includes Canadians who trace their roots to all sorts of Indian backgrounds. We're very proud that our High Commissioner can speak in Gujarati to your Prime Minister. We think he is the only High Commissioner or Ambassador who can do that, and that's quite a unique Canadian moment. Um, and one of the, one of the communities uh, that is significant in Canada that traces its roots to India is the Sikh community, which also contributes very much to our country. Hello, um, I'm Simran. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Toronto. I ran into. I was going to say, this is the young woman that I met yeah, earlier today. I ran into her. Um, I'm Did you like the U of T? Will you advertise my university that's in my oh, writing? 100%. I love U of T. I love my friends in Canada. So definitely, if anyone plans to send their kids, you should send their kids to Vic, Victoria College. Um, okay, did everybody hear that? Um, That's we right. believe in constituency service, so I have to be able to go home and say to the University of Toronto, we talked about how great it was. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm currently interning at MEA in the US and Canada division. Um, my question is regarding trade deals. So we're uh, negotiating SEPA with uh, Canada right now. And do you think we can look at trade deals from a gender lens? That's my question pretty much. And what do you think the future of SEPA is? Thank you. Okay, wow, those are excellent questions. Um, so yes, it's true. We are in the midst of negotiating a free trade agreement between Canada and India. And I discussed that with your Commerce Minister today. Um, we're also talking about a FIPA. Um, and I think that there is goodwill on both sides. Uh, you know, trade agreements can take some time to negotiate. Uh, and we always believe in Canada we want a good deal, not just any deal. I know that's India's attitude too. But I was really encouraged um, by the positive spirit of goodwill on those negotiations, and that's something that Canada brings to the table as well. And I love your question about gender and trade, um, because this is an area that Canada is very enthusiastic on. Uh, we recently updated our trade agreement with Chile, and in that trade agreement, for the first time for Canada, we included a gender chapter. Uh, we're really, really proud of that. Uh, and we believe, you know, 20 years ago, the idea of an environmental chapter in a free trade agreement was considered kind of weird and out there. Today, the idea of a gender chapter is still something that some people, you know, frankly, I think when the Canadians leave the room, they say, oh, God, you know, there go those Canadians talking about, they talk about gender with security, they talk about gender with trade, can't stop those Canadians from talking about gender. So I think there is sometimes a bit of eye rolling when we raise it, but I, I really believe that you are going to see 20 years from now, it is going to be as standard to have a gender chapter in trade agreements as it is to have an environmental chapter. And it partly goes back to Harsha's first question about income inequality and inclusive growth. Um, you know, your Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, gave, I thought, a very powerful speech at the World Economic Forum where one of the things he talked about was the rise of protectionism and the need to push back against it. And I agree, we do need to push back, but we can only push back successfully if the vast majority of our people feel they are benefiting from globalization. And guess what? 50% of the population is women. So if women are not benefiting, then you know your society isn't benefiting. So I, I think it is something that we need to work on. It's something Canada is committed to. I think this will have to be the last question because um, Christy has to leave um, at five sharp. So. Uh, my name is Rohit Gandhi. I'm, I run a digital news platform called Democracy News Live, and I also, for two decades, I've worked for the CBC. Um, one of the challenges that um, you know, Canada has faced over the last many years in the South Asian subcontinent, when I say South Asian, I mean India and in Sri Lanka, 
has been the challenge of how when separatist groups go out of here back to Canada, that no, the recognition is not there. Uh, I remember I was in, in Sri Lanka one time covering and Paul Kretien was at uh, dinner raising funds for the LTTE. Uh, and it was a coincidence, it wasn't that he knew about it, but he seemed to have fallen into the trap of raising funds for the LTT. A similar situation seems to exist right now, and uh, if that repair is not seen from the Indian side on the Canada side, that the seriousness of handling that separatist movement, then I think the challenge will continue to stay on uh, between the India and Canada relationship. Do you think Canada will take these steps seriously and address the Indian concerns? That felt to me more like advice and a meditation than a question. And I do thank you. I, I and and I, I'm not saying that facetiously. You know, thank you for the feedback. And um, events like this for me are as valuable. Like I can talk to myself all the time, but uh, and it's quite boring. But it's really valuable for me to hear from people especially when I'm visiting um, a different country. So to get that feedback is really useful. I'll re I, I, I feel that it's sort of a revisiting of the question I've been asked already, but you know, I, I, I truly understand the concerns here in India, and, and I do want to really underscore um, the fact that we in Canada, very much my prime minister, whose name is Trudeau, uh, whose father was one of our great, great fighters for a united Canada. Um, we are very personally aware of what a separatist movement means and uh, the difficulties it poses for any country, especially a democracy. Um, and we are proud in Canada, my party, we are proud to be a federalist party, and Canada's foreign policy is unambiguous in its support for a united India, and I would like everyone here in the room, and Canadians know it's our policy, but for Indians, I, I want you all to hear clearly from me, and you've heard it from our Prime Minister, that that is our unambiguous and clear policy. And let me also be clear for everyone uh, that you know, you and India have had much more direct experience of terrorism than Canada has had. I am mindful of that, and, you know, the scars and the deaths that India has endured from our perspective are mind-boggling. Um, we've had some experience ourselves, though, and we know, again, unequivocally, that we condemn terrorism we condemn violence, uh, we condemn it at home and we condemn it abroad, and we work together with all of our international partners uh, to stop this terrible scourge. Thank you, I'm afraid, I'm, I know there are many who want to ask questions, but the time constraints prevent us from taking any more questions. Uh, I think you would all agree that this was a, you know, uh, Christy had been very candid with us, uh, very insightful and very, very interesting on some of the topics that we, we discussed, we were able to discuss today. Thank you again for coming and for sharing this with us. Thank okay, you. thank you.